today I call this standing my ground. Most Christians believe because they have never been taught that they are on a lifelong glorious fiesta celebration now because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Any genuine Christian would tell you it's just the opposite. That is true. So ignorant on many Christians that they don't even know where all their troubles are coming from. And worse, they don't have a clue on how to fight and stand their ground. Did you know? Say, I am about to know. Did you know that when you made your decision for Jesus, you entered a battlefield? A battlefield with lethal enemies. Lethal enemies that are relentless, powerful, skillful killers. John 8, 44 says, The devil, the same one you just saw being cast out, that one. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, a hater of truth. So in other words, if you need to know who the devil is, that's all you need to know. He's a murderer. He'll kill you. He'll get rid of you. The Bible continues to say in John 10.10, 10, the devil has only one thing in mind. Not many, one thing. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. Sad to say, he has done this to untold millions and millions of people. And sad to say, he is still doing it even now to untold millions and millions of people. So we know we're in a battlefield because we have an enemy that wants to kill us. Secondly, we know that we're on the battlefield as Christians because the Bible refers to us as soldiers. Well, do you see soldiers sitting down watching their enemy playing dice? Do you see them playing poker? The enemies on battlefields are trained, always alert, and ready to fight. But Christians waste their time watching TV. When the enemy is armed and coming against them, Christians waste their time going to the disco. While the enemy is not dancing, he is fighting. Philippians 2.25 says, Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldiers. Paul and the apostles and the disciples knew that they were in warfare. They called themselves soldiers. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.3-4. It says, you therefore must endure hardship as a? So you're not just supposed to be a soldier. You're supposed to be a good one. In other, one, in other words, one that knows how to overcome. So it says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare. In other words, only if you're ignorant as a Christian do you do things that's contrary to warfare no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier so we're talking about standing our ground Jesus made us victors more than conquerors but we have to stand our ground. We have to fight for our place that the Lord bought for us. The Bible says we have an enemy that is lethal. He kills. He destroys. 
The Bible calls us soldiers. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, What? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called. Now watch this carefully. Two times in this one short verse. Fight, fight. Didn't say play, play. Didn't say entertainment, entertainment. It didn't say work, 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 work. It says fight, fight. Why? Because even if you are ignorant, and even if you sit back and relax, your enemy is not ignorant, and your enemy is not playing games, and your enemy is never relaxing. He is always forming weapons against you. 1 Corinthians 15, 31 and 32 says, For it is a fact. In other words, it is proven that I face death daily. But watch how Paul explains this. He said, And what value was there in fighting with wild beasts, the men of Ephesus? Wild beasts. Was he talking about a lion? Was he talking about a bear? Was he talking about a rhino? Was he talking about a hippo? Was he talking about an elephant? Was he talking about wolves? Listen to what he says. He says, I was fighting beasts at Ephesus. And then he specified who the beasts were. He says, those men of Ephesus. You see, when you become a Christian, you enter the battleground. You have an enemy. And your enemy has children. Just like God has children, your enemy has children. And they will hate you. They will target you. They will do bad things to you. They'll try to harm you, bring you down. Paul says, but I had to fight. I fought against these wild beasts, referring to people who the devil was using to try to stop him and bring him down in life. But Paul knew who was behind it all. And Paul knew he was engaged in warfare. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, be careful. Most people aren't careful. We do things out of instinct. We do things out of feelings. Many times we're not careful and we pay the consequence for it. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, be careful. Watch out for attacks from who? From Satan. Yeah. Watch out for attacks from Satan. Your enemy? It says your great enemy. So he doesn't only hate you. He really hates you. It says he prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion looking for someone, a victim, to tear apart. You know, full lions, full lions, really full lions can pass you by and they'll say, hi. But if you ever meet a hungry, I mean a really hungry lion, they won't say hi, they'll say bye. Because that's the end of you. The Bible didn't say the enemy is full. The Bible says he's really hungry. So he doesn't visit you. However he comes, he doesn't visit you to say hi. He is there to tell you bye-bye. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, for we are fighting. We are fighting against persons without bodies. It says the evil rulers of the unseen world. They don't have any bodies, but they are real. They're not of this physical world, so you can't see them, but they are real. The Bible says those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. So any Christian, any Christian, anyone that has sense enough they would know that they're in a warfare 
and that you must fight lest you be consumed. You fight lest you die. Any Christian with sense would know you entered a battlefield. And if you're drinking water on the battlefield, you die. If you're playing dice on the battlefield, you die. If you're dancing on the battlefield, you die. If you're just singing karaoke on the battlefield, you die. The battlefield is for warriors who fight because they have an enemy and they do not want to, to die. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12 says this. From the days of John the Baptist until now. In other words, it hasn't stopped. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Well, just in case nobody tell you, told you, can I tell you, if you are a Christian and I don't know that, only you know that and God know that. But if you're really a Christian, can I tell you that you have been inducted, you are now part of the kingdom of heaven. But the Bible says that from the day of John the Baptist, meaning when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God. And from then when Jesus came, the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. From who? Satan and all his demons. John the Baptist was a part of the kingdom of God. Do you know how John the Baptist died? They sliced his head off. Who did that? The demon called Herod. James the apostle died. He was a part of the kingdom of God. Many in the New Testament was martyred by the enemy because they are a part of the kingdom of God. You and I are a part of the kingdom of God. The enemy is coming and will never stop. But the Bible says the violent take it by force. I want you to look at this with me. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. In other words, the kingdom of darkness, Satan and all his demons are constantly warring against the children of God, against the kingdom of God. It says, however, the violent, meaning Christians who know how to war, Christians who are not playing games, they have learned that they're in a warfare and they're fighting. The Bible says those Christians become violent, not against people, against Satan and his demons. He says, and they take it by force. In other words, they're telling Satan, it doesn't matter what weapon you form against me. I will fight and you will lose. But what is the fight about? Ooh, very important question. What is the fight about? Be because you, you might say, well, Jesus did it all. Why should I fight? I should sit back, relax in my beach chair on the beach, drink my tequila Sheila, and let's carry it on. Because I'm a Christian. I can't lose my salvation. And I am on my way to heaven. And the devil can't do anything about it. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> the tequila and Sheila are in hell right now. What is the fight about? What is the fight about? C can I tell you what the fight is all about? Yes, can, can I tell you what the fight is all about? B because if you don't know what the fight is all about, y you're not going to fight. So I want to tell you today what the fight is all about because the Bible says we have an enemy that is fighting and the Bible says we are soldiers. But what is the fight all about? I'm so pleased to let you into the secret if you'll allow me to tell you what the fight is all about. Lost 
property. Lost property. In other words, you've made a commitment to Jesus. You know, when you read through the Old Testament, the Israelites would often overcome their enemies. However, the defeated enemy would always be regaining their strength and would always come back again to fight the Israelites. Why? Because the Israelites took their property involuntarily. You see, it's okay when you give away something. But when somebody forcibly takes something from you, you don't like it. True or false? If you have $100 and you give that to somebody, praise God. But if you have $100 and somebody take that from you, watch ya. All of a sudden you get all the energy in the world and it doesn't matter how, f- how fast that dude is running. You're trailing and you're, f- you're, you're chasing because you're going to get that $100 back. Why? Because they stole your property. What is the fight all about? Satan lost property. What property? $100? No! He doesn't care about $100 right now as I speak. He is giving all the artists in the music industry millions and millions of dollars. He doesn't want money. He loves souls. When Jesus comes and takes a soul from him, he wants to stop it, but he can't. And therefore... When his property is taken away from him involuntarily, he will not sit back, eat a piece of bread, drink some coffee, and say, Hallelujah. He is going to get up and he's going to fight with all his might to get back that lost property. You see, the problem is once you made a commitment to Satan, To enjoy everything he gives you in this world. You made a commitment to Satan to live for him. But then you found Jesus. You made a commitment to Jesus. Jesus took you out of the hands of Satan. Brought you into his kingdom. And there is war. Satan involuntarily lost you. And therefore he's going to fight. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. For once your heart was filled with darkness. Once. Yes, all of us. We were once filled with darkness, every kind of sin. The Bible says once we belonged to Satan. But now it is full of light from the Lord. So the Bible tells us why the fight The fight is, is because once the devil controlled your life, once the devil owned your life, he did everything he wanted with your life and you were on your way to hell. But somehow you found out about Jesus. Somehow you found out that there is a better, much, much better master than Satan. And you took away your commitment from the dark one. And you gave it to the one full of light called Jesus Christ. And Satan tried to stop it, but could not. Because greater is Jesus Christ than the devil in the world. But Satan lost you involuntarily. And that's why the fight He's going to fight to try and get you back with all his might. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus, who bought our freedom with his blood and forgave all our sins. Do you know how it pains the devil? I mean pain like a huge heart attack. Do you know how it pains the devil that Jesus has forgiven you? You see, Satan holds records against us. 
He holds the records of our sins. And He holds them bound tightly because of those sins, people go to hell. But Jesus came along. And Jesus forgave every one of your sins. And Satan had a heart attack. Because when your sins are forgiven, you're no longer guilty. You're no longer his. He can't hold you anymore. How do we fight against Satan? Do you, know, do you now know why there's a battle? Yes? No? Maybe so? There is a battle over your soul. There's a battle because Jesus came, the stronger man, and took you out of Satan's hand. He didn't like it. He couldn't stop it, but he didn't like it. And therefore, he's going to fight to death for you. But Jesus already died. So we don't have to die. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of this sermon very quickly on how do we fight against Satan. Because you can't pull out a knife and kill the guy. You can't take out a dynamite, a piece of bomb, and blow him up. You can't strangle him at his neck, even though sometimes we would wish we could do that. That's not the way you fight against Satan. He's an unseen being. He's an unseen enemy. So how do we fight against Satan? Say, I'm listening with my three ears. Who did you stole one from? <laughs> Listen carefully. First of all, first of all, the way you fight Satan is to recognize you're not fighting to win. You already won. <laughs> You, 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 you should have shouted amen. amen. You should have shouted hallelujah. hallelujah. You see, when you, don't, when you have not won yet, you don't know if you will win. You can cross your fingers in the battle, kiss it and say, may the force be with me. And then you realize, where was the force? I saw that on somebody's t-shirt today. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, my brother, but it just came naturally. Recognize you're not fighting to win. You already won. So the fight is not about you winning over Satan. He has already been beaten upside down. Your fight is to stand your ground. This ground has been given to me by my master, the Lord Jesus Christ. He took it from you. He gave me the title. This belongs to me. I already won. And if you come against me, I will stand my ground. Are you with me? Hallelujah. 1 John 2.14 says, I write these things to you. Because you're strong. It says the word of God is treasured in your hearts. Now listen. It says you have. Not you will. It says you have defeated the evil one. You have defeated the evil one. I brought a ladder in here earlier today. Did somebody take it? Whoever took it, bring it back for me now, please. I need my ladder. I have some construction work to do. Whoever took the blue ladder I had here, just find it for me, please. I'll give you some time. No problem at all. No sweat. The Bible says you have defeated the evil one. Brothers and sisters, look at me. The Bible didn't say you will defeat the evil one. It says you have defeated the evil one. Job done. Battle won. You have defeated the evil one. Right here is good. Thank you if you can open it wide for me. It says you have defeated the evil one. 
It's funny that people like to watch ladders. <laughs> Instead of the preacher. How do you like that? You have defeated the evil one. Because Jesus defeated him. And then he gave you the victory note. Here, he is defeated. So you have defeated the evil one. In Ephesians 2 and chapter 6, the passion translation. What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about Coke? Cake? What are you passionate about? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 6 from the Passion Translation says this. He raised us up. Now, I didn't have two. Well, I have two ladders, but I didn't have time to get the other one. But, but just, just imagine. Do, have you ever imagined anything? Oh, yes, you have. If you've been working for a long time, you're imagining your paycheck on Friday. Can't wait for it. You see the blue bills coming. Imagine with me. Jesus is on this other ladder right here. Okay? But, but, but the Bible says he raised us up with Christ. Or my camera is getting me. The exalted one. And we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now, listen, we are now co-seated with Christ. My Jesus is here. He's in the heavenly places. I am here with him in the heavenly places. We are co-seated with him. But I need to tell you another part of that story. Romans 6.20 says, And the God of peace will swiftly pound Satan to a pulp under your feet. All right. Do you have your imagination cap on? So Jesus is here in the heavenly places, far above principalities and powers and rulers and spiritual hosts of wickedness. And then he called me up here with him because I repented of my sins and I trusted him. He called you up here with him. So now we are co heirs co-seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly places and according to the Bible Satan is down there beneath my feet Satan is down there beneath your feet now watch this the only way Satan can get you because he has his eyes on Jesus I dare not I dare Dare not go where Jesus is. Because the last time I remembered, he cast me out of heaven. And Humpty Dumpty had a terrible fall. I dare not mess with Jesus. Therefore, if I am seated with Jesus, he'll never get me. Because my master is right next to me. But the devil who is fighting hard knows you more than you know yourself. So he will give you temptations to your weakness. He will send troubles beyond compare so that you can actually unrealizingly step down from your seated place with Christ and now you're down here and Satan is no longer under your feet. He's right beside you and he fights and win because you left your position in Christ. Can you take the ladder now please? He's under your feet. But a lot of us take him from under our feet and put him right back in our hearts because we meddle with things that belongs to him. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. As I pray with people around the world, some of them ask me, how have you remained strong all your life? I refuse to leave my place beside Jesus. Because the moment I leave that place, I'm gone. You're gone. 
Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, then joined heirs with Christ. Meaning, all that Jesus is, I now am with Jesus. And the devil knows that. So Paul, the one who says we are soldiers, Paul, the one who says we are in warfare, Paul, the one who says our enemy is the devil, told us how to beat him every time he comes to try to take our position, when he tries to come and take our ground. And here is how he says we can win. He says, put on the whole armor of God. God. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 says this. It says, be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with Jesus. How are we physically strengthened sometimes? Monster drink. Red Bull. And all of us, well, I won't go any, well, maybe. Weed. Woo Help me. But the Bible says be supernaturally. It doesn't say naturally. It says supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you're in union with Jesus. You know what that means? You're only as strong as when you're with Jesus. The moment you forget Him and you leave His side, you no longer have supernatural strength to fight against the devil. The Bible says, stand victorious. The Bible didn't say, stand holding your back. I have pain. Oh, pastor, heal me, please. It didn't say, stand with pain. It says, stand victorious. It says, with his explosive power flowing in. In you and through you. It says put on God's complete set of armor provided for us. So that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Now let's look at the armor. It's been given to us to stand our ground. The first piece of the armor that God gives us is the belt of truth. Not the one you use to whip your child. The belt, that's called the belt of punishment. What we're talking here about the belt of truth. Satan hates truth. He knows when you do not know the truth. Watch this scripture. In Ephesians 6.14 it says, Stand therefore, stand therefore, having girded your waist with the belt of truth. Truth. Why a belt? Military soldiers, army men, puts on a belt to hold their gears. They're in battle. In this instant, why a belt of truth? Because a belt is right next to your most inner being. Inner being, where you make all your decisions and all your choices. The Bible says, put on the belt of truth. So God wants us to live in truth from our most innermost being. What kind of truth? John 3.3. 3. Here was a super religious man by the name of Nicodemus. Jesus replied to Nicodemus with all the earnesty I possess. I tell you this, Jesus said. Unless you're born again, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Can you bear with me just for a minute? Do you know how many people are in church that are not born again? They think they're born again. Do you know how many people I pray with and talk to that tells me when I ask them, are you a Christian? Yes, pastor. How did you become a Christian? Well, as far as I can remember back into my childhood, my mom took me to church. 
As far back as I can remember, my mom and dad were Christians. So they are suggesting then that they inherited Christianity. <laughs> if you can find one place in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, that shows me God has grandchildren, I write a check for $1,000 to you. We have grandkids. God doesn't have grandkids. He has children only. Your mom and your dad were Christians. Hallelujah. That doesn't make you a Christian. You start going to church because mom and dad taught you that. Hallelujah. But that doesn't make you a Christian. There has to be a moment in your life when you renounce sin, turn away from it, and accept Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you know all of Judaism. You're a religious man. You even teach the law and you're not going to heaven. He says, I tell you, you must be born again. The Bible says you put on the belt of truth. The truth is this. In John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way. Please look at the terminology. He didn't say, I am one of the way. That would suggest there are many ways. He said, I am the way, meaning there's only one way, not two, not three. Doesn't matter what people think. I am the way, Jesus said. Yes, the truth and the life, he says, no one. Doesn't matter who we think we are. No one goes to the Father except by means of me, Jesus said. One of the biggest and most successful ways Satan fights against people and win all the time. Is to make them religious but not saved. Burning all kinds of candles in their house. Chanting all kinds of prayers. Playing all kinds of music. Reading all kinds of psalms. And still end up in hell. The truth. The belt of truth in the innermost being must say, I have renounced sin and I have made Jesus my only Savior. Secondly, the next piece of the armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Where is the breastplate? Right here. If, if your breast is anywhere else, please see a doctor immediately. This is the breast place right here. And the breast plate is over the breast. What for? Ephesians 6.14 says, Having put on the breast plate of righteousness. How do we fight against Satan to stand our ground? That word righteousness means holiness. Holiness means I do not mess with sin. Because it's the devil toys that destroys me. I now live a holy life in Christ Jesus. Meaning I don't sleep around anymore that's behind me i don't curse anymore i don't slug the bellican anymore that's behind me it's gone i don't seek the things of the world anymore the bible says put on the breastplate of righteousness can the devil look at you intently scrutinize you you know like when Jesus went to Peter one day and Jesus said to Peter Satan has asked to sift you he says but I've prayed for you well what do you do with a sift we call it a sieve what do we do with it we break down the powder or the flour or the whatever it is to the finest, finest 
point to take out whatever is in there that shouldn't be there. Satan asked to scrutinize Peter to find one fault to kill him. Can Satan watch your life today? Scrutinize you with a hellish magnifying glass and after looking from head to toe and all over your soul say this guy is serious I don't find any more filth or dirt or crap in him he's made a break for it he's living a holy life if you do not put on the breastplate of righteousness and live a holy life for God you will be taken down. Because the Bible says without holiness, no one will see God. The devil hates holiness because it was holiness that defeated him. God said, be holy for I am holy. Romans chapter 13 verse 12 through 14. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Oh Jesus, help me to have sex. Stop having sex outside of marriage. Jesus said, no, I already died for you. You stop it. Oh Jesus, help me to quit the drugs. You stop it. I already broke the chain. But you see, we're too lazy or we enjoy it too much. And we want Jesus to do what he already did. No, get out of the mess and the sin. Cast off the works of darkness. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. If you're, if you're a Christian that still gets thirsty, I, I don't know if you know what I mean. We're not talking about crystal water. We're talking about the dirty water that comes in a brown bottle. If you still get thirsty, the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no room for the flesh. In other words, if you're thirsty, don't go around bars. If you're sniffy, don't go around the joint where people sniff. Make no room for the flesh. But pastor, that's punishment. You, you, you have no idea what punishment is until you get the devil on your... Then you know what punishment really is. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, put on the shoes of the gospel. What is that? If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you should have no difficulty. You should intentionally tell people about Jesus. If you're a secret Christian, I have to hire you. You must be a detective. Jesus didn't die to make secret Christians. The Bible says the righteous is as bold as a lion. You put on the shoes of the gospel. And everywhere you go, you share your testimony. This is what Jesus did for me, like it or not. After all, your friends are not ashamed to tell you what the devil has done for them. True? You share your story with them. Oh, the devil hates. You see, the, this brings pride down to zero. The devil loves when you operate in pride because when you're operating in pride, he has you under full control. But when you can humble yourself and testify of Jesus and not about you, Satan cannot take your ground at all. Listen to what Ephesians 6.15 says. It says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on that shoes of your testimony. Go to work and tell people what Jesus did. You see, it's impossible. It's difficult, hard, terribly hard to tell your friends, let me tell you what Jesus did and drink a beer at the same time. True or false? It's hard to tell somebody about what Jesus did and you're... It doesn't work. It doesn't fit together. It has to be one or the other. So if you open your mouth and you're telling somebody about Jesus, you got to put that joint out. 
If you are telling somebody about Jesus, you got to throw away that beer. They don't fit together. You know how many times I'm walking down the street, somebody sees me, I don't know, and they know me. And from the time they see me, they do like this, the bottle, but I saw it a long time. And they hide that, they, hey, pastor, with the next hand. What happened to your next hand, buddy? Put on the shoes of the gospel. You shouldn't be ashamed to be a Christian. Do you know what it cost Jesus to make you a member of heaven? It killed him. Don't be ashamed of your testimony. Galatians 6.14 says this. As for me, God forbid that I should boast about my new golf cart. About my house and all my apartments. God forbid that I should just boast about all the money I have in the bank and how things are going well for me. This is Paul the Apostle. He says, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Tell somebody you're a Christian and then tell them what Jesus did for you. It says, put on the shield of faith. Put on the shield of faith. Look at this. Ephesians 6.16. In every battle, you will need faith as your shield. In every battle. Because the devil will come to test your faith. If you say you have faith in Jesus, look out. He's coming. He's going to test it. Because you need to know that your faith is real. So it says in every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. You can't see these arrows. You can't see them when he is making them. You can't see them when you shoot them. You only feel it afterwards. He sends them all the time. The Bible says you stand against it with faith. You see, when you get sick, it's not time to complain to God. God, why me? When you're broke, God, why me? The devil looked back and says... C come here, my courts. Look at this. Look at this piece of crap. He says he goes, she goes to church and prays the Lord, but every time we send an arrow, she complains against God. First John 5 4 5. You see, every child of God overcomes the world. How? It says, for our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. So we are the world conquerors, defeating its power. Those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Put on faith. You must say to yourself in the mirror every day when you wake up. Now you look at me, whatever your name is. If you're Nicodemus, you say, now you look at me, Nicodemus. But don't, don't do it before you took a bath because you might not like yourself too much. Take your bath and put on your clothes and, and look prepped. And then you go to the mirror and you look at yourself and you say, you Nicodemus, listen to me carefully today. I want you to understand that no matter what the devil throws my way today, we are not going to fuss, we're not going to fight, we're not going to complain. We're going to shout a hallelujah anyway. We're going to praise the Lord anyway. And then you have the helmet of salvation. Most people just wear a helmet because they ride a motorcycle. Some, Shanique will tell you, some don't even use their helmet the bible instructs us to put on the helmet of salvation why watch this with me carefully ephesians 6 17 says put on the helmet the power of salvation's full deliverance to do what to protect your thoughts from lies you see when you become a christian the devil will lie to you oh yeah you think you're a christian and then he reminds you of what you just said, what you just did. He reminds you of how you just failed. And then he comes to you and say, so you, this is international, is, 
this how you say you're a Christian? When you get sick, the, doc, the, 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 the devil will tell you, ah, you're not getting rid of this one this time. When you don't have enough money to pay your bills, the devil will come and say, I knew it. You're not getting out of this one this time. When you are mad like hell, husband and wife, the devil will come and tell you, just like your dad, you're getting a divorce. Just like your mom, you're getting a divorce. The Bible says, put on the helmet of salvation. Devil, I do not walk by sight, but by faith. I do not focus on the things that I can see. I focus on the things that I cannot see. The glory of God. Put on that helmet to fight against the devil. I'm not here, devil, for you to tell me who I am. Jesus already told me who I am. I am victorious. I am a winner. I am an overcomer. I am blessed beyond a curse. Devil, you are defeated. You are a liar. You can never be saved. You will eternally burn in the lake of fire. 1 Peter 1.13 I'm getting ready to close, are you? So then, prepare your hearts and your mind for action. It says stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that is coming to you. For every trouble God gives grace. For every problem God gives grace. Do you know what the grace of God is? The grace of God is His enabling power. You know like, like, like you are a two by two pickup truck. Now, now a two by two pickup truck is well on the highway but put it in mud it stays there. You are like a pickup truck that is a two-wheel drive. But when you get Jesus on board, you become a four-wheel drive. You're prepared for anything and you can come out of any mess. Nothing holds you back because of the grace of God. I'm getting ready to close, are you? The sword of the Spirit says, take up the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17 through 18. Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What do you do with the Word of God? What do you do with the Word of God? It says, pray it all the time on every occasion. In other words, you don't fight the devil with pious prayers. Oh, devil, I'll tell you what. You are beneath my feet. And you know what, devil? You this, you that. The devil laughs and says, this little. You know what makes the devil tremble? When you know the word of God and you speak the word of God against him. He takes that old ancient tale, roll it up and say, sorry, I thought you didn't know. The Bible says take the sword of the Spirit and you fight the devil with that. When sickness comes, by His stripes I am healed. When my marriage doesn't look well, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. When my finances are low, my God, God shall supply all my needs according to His riches in glory. You take the sword of the Spirit and you fight the devil with that. But pastor, what if I do not know the Word of God? Too bad. Do you know the horoscope? You know why you know the horoscope? Because you spend time on it. Spend time on the Word and you'll get to know the Word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For whatever God says to us in His Word is full of living power. Isaiah 55 and 11 says, So also is my Word. I send it out. It always, not sometimes, my Word 
always produce fruit and prosper every time I send it. Psalms 119 and 89. Stand firm and unchangeable in the heavens and fasten to eternity is what? The word of God. So, so if the word of God is fixed in heaven, unalterable, unchangeable, the devil knows that. And therefore, the devil has to respect that. The devil has to honor that because God's word cannot be changed by anyone. And when you get to know God's word and you live God's word and you claim God's word and you declare God's word, the devil has to back off because the word is already settled in heaven. My brothers and my sisters, those of you watching all around the world, Jesus made you more than a conqueror. Are you standing your ground? Jesus gave you a position over the devil, higher than the kingdom of darkness. Are you standing your ground? Can I have my worship team up here with me? You're more than a conqueror. You need to stand your ground. You just heard a mouthful. You just had a belly full. What are you going to do with it? I want you to think about it. These messages are on YouTube, Facebook. Go back. Go back again when you're just before you go to bed at night and listen to it again. You do not have to continue the path that you're going being defeated. God made you a victor. Now, for the sake of the people online, I want to close in prayer and then we're going to worship the Lord. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? My dear brothers and sisters all around the world, sons and daughters of God, your royalty, your victors, you're more than a conqueror. God has given you a place, a ground, way above the enemy. God has made you seated with Jesus Christ above all principalities and powers and rulers and dominion. Stand your ground. Live for God. Push back the enemy every time he comes with the word of God. Father in heaven, I know sometimes our troubles and our problems can be overwhelming. But I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would remind your people every time. They're never alone. They're seated with you. The enemy cannot touch them as long as they sit with you in the heavenly places. And I pray that you would remove every form of discouragement at this moment. I pray that you would remove every depression from them. I pray that you would remove every discouragement far that they cannot even think about it anymore, Lord God. And that you would fill them with truth. That you would fill them with hope. And God, that their hearts would be filled with faith and belief. And that they would declare what you say. And that they would remain victors. I take authority over the enemy right now and I bind him. You liar, that's all you can do. You deceive people from the very beginning right up until now. I bind you and command you to loose the minds of God's people. They are who God says they are. They are not who you say they are. I relieve you from your duties against them now in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen.